well, yes, we also have the behaviors that would be diagnosed as as being ADHD in the US. But in Finland, we call those, you know, we call that childhood. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are here to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve every aspect of your business and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is the best-selling author of books like The Atlas of Happiness, Gone Viking and How to Be Sad, just to name a few. Her first book, A Year of Living Danishly, was an international bestseller and has even been optioned for television. When she's not writing critically acclaimed books, you can find her work in The Times, The Guardian, The Telegraph and The Wall Street Journal. In addition to her work on the page, you can hear her insights on emotional intelligence and mental health on her podcast, How To Be Sad, as a contributor on BBC Radio 4, or critically acclaimed podcasts like Freakonomics. Helen Russell... Welcome to the Humorology Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Paul, and for that lovely introduction. Oh, well, it was all true. And uh, I'm a great admirer of your work. I, I remember reading The Year of Living Danishly ages ago, and it was just such a joy and, and, and with so many insights. But we'll come to that uh, in due course. Uh, the Jesuits say, give me a child of seven and I will give you the man or woman. What was the young Helen Russell like, and was she humorous? Um, I would, yeah, well, I was a little bit Hermione Granger, I hear reports, and I sort of remember that I was quite, I was always sort of pushing my hand up the highest in class and really just bursting and probably incredibly irritating. But I, um, I grew up with, with uh, my mum, I didn't have brothers and sisters when I was growing up, so I was around adults a lot. I. Um, I, in, uh, very few seven or eight-year-olds endured a lifetime ban from Eton Wine Bar, but that's what happened to me because I would go out for dinner with with the adults and I would be bored with their conversation. So I'd play with the candles and ended up setting fire to the table. And so I was, um, yeah, I had I had a strong kind of sense of what I found funny, and it was in the era my mum was forever disappearing to, to up to London to go to Jonglers. So um, yeah, I kind of I was interested in the funny quite early, I think. Your mum went to jongleurs. You know that uh, both my acts, Morris Minor and the Majors and the Calypso Twins, used to play jongleurs all the time. And when when we met last, I I did a little oh Paul, that sounds familiar. And then I did see yes, oh what what happy days those must have been. So me and Ainsley might have got your mum on stage to dance. I I will ask her if she has any recollection of such a <laughs> tremendous occasion. <laughs> well, I apologise now. Uh, so, obviously, your mum went to Jongleurs. Humour was actually valued in your home then? We're from you know, an Irish Catholic family. We, we sort of do humour, especially in the bleak times. And I think, but we were also growing up in, in England the whole time. It, it was very much that sense of, Oh, well, just um, if you can laugh about it, then nothing's ever quite so bad. So we would make jokes instead of maybe going to the grittier heart of many situations, I'd say. Um, and yeah, humour was was very important. I used to get sent away from Sunday lunch because I'd be giggling so much that I would be needing to go to the bathroom. I mean, it was very it was a lot about about humour, I think, growing up. And was I mean, I don't know if this is a delicate subject, but I'd heard you uh talk that your your sister died when you were young and so you've experienced loss what happened and you don't have to answer this obviously but within the fi family dynamic was it was it parked or was it or were you protected from that and was humor important to dealing with that uh, yes and no I think parked is certainly it. it it wasn't spoken about and so that actually became quite problematic as I got older because I would tend to make light of any situation I would make jokes at funerals and you know it just it's not always appropriate it's very helpful um, and there are far worse coping mechanisms but actually 
it, it wasn't really um so my sister died of what was called cot death at the time when I was uh, very young, nearly three. And, and there just wasn't the vocabulary to deal with any of that. So, so yeah, we kind of carried on. And, and then when things were funny, we really lent into that. And then you didn't have to think about the pain and the darkness. And I think I would say perhaps our sensibilities and, and comedy has evolved to, to bring in that light and shade and to incorporate all of those life experiences now. But growing up, it was very much if you had the light switch turned on, the comedy switch turned on, then you didn't have to think about the painful things. So in that way, um, I've had to kind of relearn my relationship with laughter as I got older, I think. Through writing, do you think you've learnt more about that? I think they, I mean, one of the beautiful luxuries of, of being a writer is that you get to, there are different parts to, to the job, as you know. So you there are bits where you're out there talking about your work and you're promoting, and you're being quite jazz hands. And then there's other parts where you squirrel yourself away for months on end, wearing sweatpants and jumpers with holes in as today. And and you're just with your with your thoughts and there is no avoiding anymore. You can't, I mean, you can make a joke on paper, but you kind of had to face anything that you've been running away from. And that's quite helpful. And it's, um, you know, I grew up, grew up Catholic. I'm quite good with the confessional. So actually there's something very cathartic about writing about how you're actually feeling, knowing full well that you can get the red pen to it and edit it later. So yes, I think I found it much more comfortable in that very safe space to get to grips with the full breadth of um, the emotional uh, landscape. In your book and your brilliant podcast, How To Be Sad, you say that uh, sadness is going to happen, so we might as well learn how to do it well. Uh, was that because you were initially looking at happiness, and we'll come to that, was that uh, as a result of looking at happiness, you thought how we really have to address sadness? Well, a... Um... Pre-pandemic, I was doing a talk at the Barbican of all places, and um, it was all lovely. And I was talking about my book, The Atlas of Happiness, and I had questions afterwards. And people were saying, oh, you know, if you've just lost a loved one, how can you be happy then? Or if you've just been made redundant or been made homeless? And it struck me that perhaps I had not been clear or that I had been misleading even that that we shouldn't expect happiness at all times. And sadness is a very appropriate response to loss or disappointment in our lives. And when the lockdown hit and the world went a little crazy, um, I ended up talking to my then therapist about this, who said it's no surprise at all to him that I had spent 10 years researching into happiness because I too was quite scared of that sadness, very scared of the darkness. I had no tools with which to deal with it other than humour, other than avoidance um, and trying to make light of it. So then it struck me that I was in the same boat, that I also didn't know how to cope with being sad, but that it was always going to come to all of us. So that didn't seem very healthy. And actually, we've been sold a very narrow definition of happiness that means never being sad and never doing hard things. And as you say, life isn't like that. So I wanted to explore that and unpick it a little more. No. Well, you, you mentioned that you went to a therapist and you've been very upfront about the fact that you've had therapy over the years. Do you think it is the search for happiness is as a result of the fear of sadness, perhaps. Um, yes, but it's almost it's almost worse than that because it's almost complete avoidance. It's not even daring to contemplate that that might be there. It's um, I think from a very young age, many of us all have been raised with um, perhaps parents who grew up wanting to make things sunny and nice for us all the time. And so if you fall over, you're told, oh, get up, it's OK, um, or don't cry, or it doesn't hurt, you'll be fine. And actually, that's really confusing. As a young child, from a young age, you learn to distrust your emotions or um, distrust your response or think that being sad is somehow wrong and there is a, then a shame attached to it. And so there have been studies from you know, Harvard, from um, studies going back decades now, showing that actually if we try to suppress any sort of emotion, it will bob back up like a like a um, inflatable ball at the at the beach or something. And so actually, if we don't um, allow ourselves to feel this sadness, if we're always running from it, if we think when we do feel sad that something is wrong with us in inverted commas, and then try to pathologize it, then that's even more harmful because then we're going to feel shame and we're not going to be able to deal with the normal sadnesses that life will throw at us. So it's about acceptance, is it, in, in that sense? Yeah, acceptance. But it, which sounds very simple, but actually it is quite radical because so much of our society is, um, or at least historically, has been set up to to 
not accept it and to not even acknowledge it. So I guess since post World War Two, and of course there were perfectly understandable and legitimate reasons for wanting to just just keep calm and carry on, and and the old you know Winston Churchill ideas, and obviously he didn't say that, but that that idea that there was nowhere to put the the extent of the grief and the mourning, and so we just had to carry on. But it's you know what we don't talk about can hurt us, and so I think. It's acceptance, yeah, but it's then sitting with it and thinking, well, how do I deal with this? Because I, I've never learned how. I, my parents never learned how. So where do we then go from there? So it felt like a bigger, um, you know, carpet to unravel. It's really fascinating for me from a psychological perspective of of the acceptance. But where does that stop, and where do you stop that start wallowing in it, and? and not leaping out of it you know where's the happy medium in that it's so interesting it's only ever men who ask how long does the wallowing have to last (laughs) i find it really interesting but yeah absolutely i think um there has to and i've experienced depression as well but we have to uh, differentiate between uh, normal sadness which is a response to loss or disappointment or things not turning out how we might have hoped and depression which for, for for better or for worse is currently defined as having five out of these nine symptoms for two weeks or more so there is a medical definition of when it's too much wallowing um that's also quite problematic and probably quite individual there used to be as you'll know the the dsm the diagnostic and statistical manual from the us which is meant to be just for the us for the whole world ends up using it was meant to, it usually had a grief clause so that you couldn't be diagnosed with depression within, I think, two months of experiencing a bereavement. Well, that was done away with at the last uh, DSM-5. So now, even though you could be having a perfectly normal response to losing a loved one, for example, you could still get a diagnosis of depression. You could still be prescribed antidepressants, which I've also taken. So I'm not anti any of these things, but I just want to sort of be clear and look at the granularity of those things. So of course, yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to stay at home forever. So part of what I then researched was, well, when when do we actually need to get help? When do we need to, um, even though we may not feel like it, put ourselves back into our community and try and do something for someone else? And that's a really helpful way when we're feeling low. Um, when do we need to get a different perspective from books or from culture or just getting back out there in the world? So it's not just about sitting on your own um, in a darkened room, but that might be a part of it for a day or so. Yeah. Oh, I, I like that you've you've given it for a day or so at the end of that. <laughs> it's not, not not official guidance. No, exactly. No, I'm interested because when I first started um, uh, training doctors at, at Guy's Kings and St. Thomas's, um, DSM, uh, we were still on DSM one or two, I think, which was uh, this thick. Which thinner, uh, yes. And now at DSM five is this. And I, I always wondered... Well, is this led by the pharmaceutical industry trying to find more things to um, give pills for, if you like? Uh, And are we overdoing it by giving everything a label? It sounds like you think so. I I do think so a little bit as well. I think um, I'm currently looking into the Nordic approach to various things uh, within childhood. And for example, ADHD um, is something that many Finnish academics will say, well, yes, we also have the behaviours that would be diagnosed as as being ADHD in the US. But in Finland, we call those, you know, we call that childhood. We expect those things. So I certainly think there is something around, um, yeah, of course, a big pharmaceutical industry whose interests lie within pathologizing many human conditions I I like the idea of not what's wrong with you but what's happened to you we all have stories we've all been through some stuff and that will have an impact but um, I also spoke to neuroscientists and um, geneticists and um, psychotherapists and just some of the best minds in the world who who all kind of agreed we don't know which was so rather disheartening but also it felt like less of a sinister plot to destroy our lives because people were saying we just don't know why the brain reacts the way it does it's incredibly complicated obviously and so the the neuroscientist dean burnett was was really interesting talking about you know actually how the brain is working and that although maybe giving antidepressants for example 
maybe a bit of a blunt instrument. It's kind of the best we've got, especially in an overstretched NHS. And so although it would be great if everyone was able to access talking therapies, there aren't even enough therapists to go around, even if there was the financial resources for that. So it's it's a problem without solutions right now. And um, there are some great minds trying to work on fixing that. But at the moment, yeah, there isn't there doesn't seem to be a very clear route. And and that's really unfair for many people. Yeah, uh, my my slight concern is well, more than a slight concern is that uh, that once we label everything, what happens psychologically is that people start to play up to the label. So they go ADHD or dyslexic, and then they start to wear it as a badge, and act as if they have that, and then it becomes normalised within them. Well, I can't do that because I am X rather than and and i think maybe it was done to help but it also can have be a hindrance to 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 people moving forward what what do you think about that it's really challenging i think and and you know this is not my area of expertise but i think in terms of of adhd it's a really interesting one and having two small boys it, it's a constant thing that parents and and teachers are talking about and and many of these behaviors i would just think well that's just a child that's just of course they don't want to sit still but on the flip side I know a lot of women my age in their 30s and 40s getting diagnoses of, of ADHD that have actually been a, really helpful and a huge relief because for so long there was such um, um, a rather narrow idea of, of ADHD is really it's for young boys and because these women are high functioning they're um, highly educated there's a sense that well there can't be anything wrong but actually it's not that they're, they're not acting out their lives hugely differently, but it's it's been very comforting and helpful for them to understand the why things sometimes sometimes feel harder for them than they might for other people. So I, I take your point, but I don't know. I'd be kind of cautious about taking away something that has, from my experience of, of friends experiencing ADHD, has hugely helped them. And that's the problem, isn't it? Because it on one hand it can do. I mean, I I think. Probably we're all on some kind of spectrum at, at different times in our lives. But if we keep subdividing it into it, then we'll all be going, I, I've got something, you know, because there are certain situations whereby we're all, you know, a little bit, you know, <laughs> ADHD with that, you know, is it ADHD to get upset when there's washing in the, in the sink? And uh, nobody's done it. You see what I mean? Is it? I don't know where it stops or starts. But this is about humour, so uh, we're looking at it humorously. Obviously, <laughs> um, I I was intrigued because you uh, were the editor of MarieClaire.co.uk, and uh, you lived this glamorous life in London, and then. As a result of your husband getting his dream job at Lego, you ended up in a small town in the rural hinterlands of, of Denmark. Now, Denmark, as you have so beautifully told us over the years, is routinely or near the top at uh, the every happiness and ranking compiled by the United Nations. And your book, which I talked about earlier, The Year of Di Living Danishly, uh, is all about uncovering the secrets of the world's happiest country. So we're on the Humorology podcast. What are the secrets, Helen? <laughs> no pressure. Right. Um, <laughs> I think, well, it's not the weather for starters, but that is terrible. It was so cold. I had to run home from the supermarket today and I was not dressed for it. It was just so uh -huh. perishing. Um, yeah, not much sunshine. I think there is a big thing to do with the trust here. It's hard to know what feeds into each other, but 79% of Danes trust most people, which I found extraordinary. I grew up, you know, living near London and in Thatcher's Britain and then worked and lived in London for 12 years. So it's just not my experience of the world. And it took a long time for me to relax into that a bit. And I wouldn't say I'm quite there yet, but I'm working on it. Um, I think they have this great work-life balance that helps you're going to feel a little cheerier if you know that you're going home at 4 p.m. Um, admittedly, they do start at 8 a.m., but it's it's quite a nice environment. And they 
there's this really flat hierarchical structure. So it's totally accepted. You can call out your boss or, or a colleague and everybody is quite informal. So at school, there's no uniform. You call your teacher by the first name. This carries on to office life where it's, I haven't seen anyone wearing a tie for, I mean, years now. It's very low key. And there's lots of times that they stop and have coffee and cake. So it's quite a nice life. Everything costs a lot, but um, there's more of a sense, well, you don't need money is not a status symbol here as much as it might be elsewhere. They do this great thing whereby if you buy a car, which is horrifically expensive anyway, I think it's still 180 cent tax. So even my old banger costs absolute fortune. But if you buy a car, the registration number gives no indication of what year it's from as it does back home, because uh-huh. that wouldn't be fair. That would be showing off your wealth and you might make other people feel bad if they saw that you had a new flash car. So it's just little things like that that you think there's there's so much evidence that inequality leads to unhappiness. And although it's not perfect, there is less inequality in Denmark and the Nordic countries in general. And so I think they take away many of the reasons for unhappiness, I would say, rather than that they are all jazz hands happy all the time, because they are certainly not that. Oh, I love that idea that they take away the reasons for unhappiness and everything. And so, I mean, I, I work a lot in Norway as well, and I have done some work in, in Denmark. So I've noticed it. And that ability for we're all the same. I, I was I was recently doing some lectures in Norway and I was chatting to an American barman in a in a bar. And he said, the brilliant thing about this is nobody looks down on me. When I was in America, everybody was, oh, you're just a barman. Here, I am uh, respected in society. And also, I'm paid almost the same as a teacher. Because you're paying such high tax anyway, it kind of doesn't matter so much what your job is, because the take-home pay at the end of the massive tax man taking all your money is is pretty similar. So yes, absolutely, you could be a barman. I mean, I'd probably earn more working behind a bar than I do as a writer here. So um, yes, it's it, you take a job because you're interested in it. And education is free, so you can train to get a job you actually like. So that's going to help. You even get paid to study over the age of 18. The student grants. Huh. I can actually see your face light up for those of you listening and not watching. Uh, Helen's face lights up when she talks about the fact that there is an equality. And so, therefore, do you think that the, the repressed Britain with its sort of history of class and everything means that uh, there is no intrinsic trust and ability to have that happiness and trust across everything. There's something about the sense of community and I don't know if you can get that sense of community if you haven't got the trust and the equality. There are many things I miss about the UK and the US where I used to work quite a lot and I think coming out of lockdowns there isn't much sense of awe um, or wonder or any of that stuff especially in Denmark which is very flat and you know Norway's got you've got the fjords it's a little bit more dramatic but um, life isn't always exciting and by always, I mean, <laughs> I feel seldom ever. exciting. <laughs> yeah. But it's these sort of simple pleasures. So I, I personally, I'm finding that now quite a hard balance. I've been here for 10 years now and, and it's a very nice life. It's very hard to leave, but I miss those highs and lows. And I don't know, I don't know whether that it's just because I'm actually a masochist or whether there is something in the human spirit or just my personality who that just craves that you know, excitement or um, those highs. And I don't know, but it's a really good standard of life. And uh, yeah, I haven't seen a similar thing in the UK for a while now. I know that when you were stressed, and we're talking about that stressed in London with this um, stressful lifestyle, having to get the magazine out online and and do that, um, you were trying to start a family, but despite various fertility treatments, it's what not working and the feedback from professionals then was it was probably down to stress um you fell pregnant just six months after living in denmark coincidence pastries who knows um (laughs) i think there is yeah i think uh yeah it's a it's a very strange one and i'm very grateful to denmark for that you know calmness i think who knows what goes on I think I'd had a lot of fertility treatments maybe there's still stuff lurking around in me that was helping um I think 
honestly, I think coming from the world of fashion magazines 10 years ago, where it was very, um, I've worked with wonderful people and sort of really sort of women at the top of their game, really inspirational, amazing women, but it's the fashion world. And so the goal in London in the 2000s was stick thin and all of that stuff. And, and that's not very helpful either. And I think coming to Denmark where the aesthetic is more strong and Viking and nobody wants to be stick thin because you will not survive winter. You will crumble. Yeah. So I think there's definitely something about that and, and just relaxing into it a bit more and, eating all the pastries and so yes I was very grateful for for that and yeah after years of fertility treatment and being basically a pincushion to finally be pregnant was was amazing and I was very that did help with my happiness a lot. Well and you have three children now um, what have children taught you about humour? I think an awful lot I mean wouldn't you say I think I think um it kind of woke me up into my body. I'd been a column for my head. My body had been for as long as uh, that I really remember. I mean, probably since childhood. And then suddenly it's such a corporal experience, especially as a woman. And so your whole body is changing. You feel these people growing inside you. I mean, that's funny just for starters. The experience yeah. of being pregnant is just bonkers and surreal and people are wriggling inside you. And then I had, you know, I had twins. So I had twins via IVF because it's hard to relax enough to get pregnant again once you already have a very angry redheaded toddler running around so um <laughs> IVF not so funny but being pregnant with twins I mean hilarious for a moment until I went on bed rest because I was enormous and I'm small and it didn't work but um but yeah just feeling I mean basically two wrestlers inside you fighting okay. each other it's just surreal and then having once I the, they were all out on the outside um just funny. I mean, there's just a sort of visceral pleasure. And growing up without siblings, it was really moving and profound to be part of that um, almost like lion cubs play fighting. And so I'm very physical with my children and they have a dad, which I didn't growing up. So it's a very physical um, play fighty family, which I love and I never had before. And that is such a source of joy and often much hilarity. So that's been really special and then of course kids say ridiculous things uh, my five-year-old son right now likes to get down stairs first every morning and find the old cd player that we have and put on at full blast everybody dance now um by cnc sound factory i think from the 1990s and that's what we all start the day to so they are just yeah frequently hilarious and everyone thinks their kids are hilarious mine really <laughs> well of course but also isn't there that thing whereby um is, don't the statistics say that children laugh three to four hundred times a day and adults only laugh 17.5 times a day? So we could learn a lot from children and having children around you. Do you just find that you are laughing along with them more? Yes. I mean, there's something very infectious about giggling and giggling children. I think Sophie Scott, I'm sure you've spoken to, but she's very good on um, laughter being infectious, like a yawn. And so, yeah, yeah there's certainly that. Although actually there's, there are many studies from showing that um, parents are less happy than non-parents, except for in a few countries. But in Denmark, it's one of the countries. <laughs> parents are meant to be less happy because they're just stressed and it's just tiring and it's hard work. And, and because in Denmark, everything's so expensive, people tend to do their own stuff. So you clean your own house, you do your own I don't know. I can't think of other things that you outsource. I haven't done it for so long, but you're, you're not outsourcing any of the more menial jobs of life. So um, parents are all working. 80 percent of mothers work in Denmark. So people are exhausted, but they are doing it. I don't think they choose any other way. But yeah, I think I th I'm sure there's something about catching the laughs from them as well. Well, yeah, there's a saying in psychology that if you want anyone to go into any state, you have to go into that state first. So, I mean, I think children are the ultimate state changers, aren't they? And it just it just reminded me because uh, the only Danish comedian who I've ever heard of, Victor Borger, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but uh, you should look him up and all our listeners should look him up. He had a quote which was the shortest distance between two people is a smile. And I just... I just love that. And so if you're surrounded by giggling children, children are having fun. It's hard not to for that not to be infectious, isn't it? Yes, I wouldn't like to overstate the um, the, the fun versus tears quote. Though. I, think, <laughs> I would say it's the emotional extremes. So whilst I can often catch the giggles from them, 
I if I went with them every time they were having full on tantrums on the floor, then it'd be a very um, a much sadder picture. So, yeah, there's uh, it's it's not all rainbows and unicorns. But isn't that one of the lessons that you know, with your books, so you've been on this journey that, you know, there will be tears before bedtime, for instance. But guess what? We can shut those down quite quickly and get to laughter quite quickly as well. Isn't isn't that the journey you've been on? We mustn't shut them down. Right. So th this is the, the Danish way, but also um, the way that from from researching how to be sad, that all the, the psychologists and experts said it's it's more about it's acknowledging their feelings. And it's okay. and it's it's not saying that that's nothing to worry about. It's saying I, I see that you're you're having pain there, that you're very worried about that. or That's upset you. We talk about that. We we make a plan. We'll maybe try and work on it together and then you can relax and read Tintin or yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, I know. I accepted my my language pattern wasn't exactly full on, uh, I, but it's kind of like. Um, but you have to accept when it's real tears, don't you? Because when my son, my son's now twenty one, but when my son was young, uh, what I noticed, obviously doing what I do, is whenever he was with his grandparents, he the grandparents would panic when he was uh, when he fell over. And uh, and they would do that horrified face and he would look to see um, if he should be upset by it. And so I anchored him into a completely different state was whenever he fell over, he would go, well, that's funny, isn't it? And so so early slapstick. So it was funny. And by the way, if he really was hurt, then he would cry. But his first notion was to go, oh, it's funny, rather than it's tragic. And I think that's the balance we have to find, whereby not every time they fall over is, is terrible, is it? No, you're absolutely right. Yeah, resilience. I'm all about physical resilience. And I think they're quite good on that. In Denmark, it's, it's my, all of my kids go to scouts and they learn to that fire is hot. They learn that when they whittle wood, they will cut themselves or me sometimes if I'm holding the sticks, it's terrible. Um, yes, yeah, so there's lots of, because the weather is so terrible, you are, you are experiencing physical discomfort every day. <laughs> Lucky are they. So yeah, they are often cold and damp and a bit unhappy about that. Um, and yeah, if they fall over, it's it's up again, it's up again. Um, but yeah, you can tell, can't you, if it's real tears or if it's just my brother's got something that I haven't. Well, uh, with this, I have a I have a theory that um, what's happened generally to people, and uh, I'm just interested if if this is going too far, but. Life is now like, you know, it, when you lived in London, you'd wake up in the middle of the night and a car alarm would have uh, gone off. And yeah, now it's ours, yeah, which I think is nicer. But but the car alarm would have gone off and you go, oh, is the car uh, being broken into? But then you'd realise that actually just a cat had, had walked past it. And the alarm was set wrong. And I think sometimes people generally set themselves wrong. So, you know, something minor happens and it's it's terrible and it, it, it's a disaster when, in fact, resilience, which you just mentioned, is that my father was 17 in the Second World War. You know, a different level of, you know, of thinking about what is a disaster, and and it sounds like in Denmark they've 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 got a good balance on that. There's a lot of data around that the way our brains are still set up is that we still think we are going to be attacked by a saber toothed tiger any minute, and so we we put that same yeah you're right level of of fear or or anxiety or fight or flight response or or freeze um, onto things that don't warrant it. So I think there's certainly something there. And then and then the kind of the negativity bias of, of of always sort of thinking the worst, which made sense if we were trying to learn that picking those strange red berries meant danger. But now we probably don't need that all the time. And yeah, there's mm. there's our brains are not perfect, are they? No, but we can train them to be appropriate and better is is what i think and i think that's one of the hardest things about parenting is to is to 
point your children in the right direction for each of those ways. They're all different, right? I mean, I think I have yeah. one who's, who tends towards a negativity bias far more than the others, and they have been parented the same as far as I know, so they're, they're just themselves. Uh, yeah, no, that's true. What makes you laugh, Helen? I think... I mean, it's really, I mean, the scatological still makes me laugh, which I'm not proud of, but I think what makes me laugh, I, I like the kind of the pricking pomposity. I like um, I like things that are ridiculous, but true. I tend to gather people around me, good friends who who are also magnets for the ridiculous. And that is a source of, of just constant joy. So that's fun for me. You talked of your mum going to jongleurs. I mean, is there any comedy that uh, you, you absolutely crave and love? All of it, basically. I used to love, I mean, I used to see sort of people like Sarah Pascoe and Josh Widdicombe and, and Rob Beckett back in the day when they were just starting out in London. And I loved all that stuff. So I do miss seeing live comedy. Sophie Hagen is a great Danish comedian. Um, but I, yeah, I don't see comedy as much as I would like to anymore. So I have to consume it all through my ears or on TV. Apart from the odd one, there aren't many great Scandinavian comedians that have broken out into the world. Is that as a result that everything's too comfortable and, and for comedy to actually uh, flow, it needs to be a little bit uncomfortable? I don't know that in the UK or the US uh, there, is, um, there is such a uh, tradition of embracing as as one of your own um, comedians from countries where English is not the first language. So you think about maybe like Henning Vane, but other than that, there aren't that many breakthrough comedians. So I'm not sure it's necessarily a Scandinavian thing. Um, but yeah, there's not, I mean, there's a big music culture, of course, we mm -hmm. think of as Scandinavia. So yeah, perhaps it's more of that, but actually the Danish sense of humour is quite like the British in many ways, although they do love Mr Bean. I think it's slightly broader, the Danish sense of humour. They love Mr Bean and Midsummer Murders. So. You talked about music and uh, I believe that you use music as what I would call an anchor, a, a short sort of shortcut to an emotional state. Do you think people should be more conscious of uh, building in time for humour and happiness, using things like music to get there? Music for humour, that's an interesting one. I haven't given that so much thought, although uh, when we spoke about speaking today and you, and perhaps I'm jumping ahead here, but you asked about, is there a film that makes me laugh? And the film that makes me laugh just so much, even just thinking about it, is, is most of Will Ferrell's work, but Eurovision, the film, I just adore because I love Eurovision anyway. I went to Eurovision when it was in Serbia uh, to report on it. Generally a huge fan. And the idea of doing something with love and passion, but also making it funny, I love. And the songs from that are guaranteed to make me smile, even if I'm just walking the dog and picking up whatever presents he's decided to leave somewhere. I don't know. I feel like music to get to emotion is a more conventional and easier shortcut. Um, how about you? Do you? Is there a song that makes you, that takes you to humour? Unfortunately, they're all rude. I mean, uh, I love Monty Python when they go, they sing, sit on my face and tell me that you love me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but those kind of things which are blatantly inappropriate. I love when it's done with such sincerity, which it makes me laugh uproariously when something is like that. But uh, I just think it's a shortcut. You're, you use it as a shortcut to emotional states. And I just wondered, it's, is it uh, too much of a leap to go to, you know, to, to laughing with music as well. I do love that when you're walking along the street with headphones on in your own private world and something makes you laugh, whether it's a podcast or a piece of music, and it just feels like such a sort of uh, a free gift almost from the universe. It's just such a lovely moment. I recommend, if you haven't le yet listened to it, is The Lion of Love from the Eurovision soundtrack, um, performed by Dan Stevens of Downton Abbey. It's very good, but uh, mm. that's a good point. I will try that. Thank you. Good advice for future. Do you think it's important to be able to laugh at yourself, Helen? I think it's essential. I mean, who wants to spend time with someone who can't? How tedious. I just haven't got the, I just, no. Yeah, I think um, I have now reached an age where 
I feel as I've earned the right to leave parties that I don't want to be at and not keep up friendships that aren't working anymore. And I, I don't, yeah, I don't want to really be around people who can't laugh at themselves. Do you think that's good for mental health ultimately to realise that we are all ridiculous on some level? And, and you talk about Denmark with this even society. Do you think that's, I mean, I know how that Britain does it in the sense of where well, we call it taking the piss, basically. So nobody becomes the tall poppy in 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 those things. Do, 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 is it the same in Denmark or do you recognise that as a, a, a as a British thing? It's even more pronounced in Denmark. They is have um because they have this thing called Yante's Law, which is from uh, it's from a, a fiction book from the I think 1930s where it's all these rules for living, these 10 rules for living that are basically to, to crystallise is the idea that you're not to think you're better than anyone else and showing off showing off is frowned on. It's perhaps all right, that's why you haven't had so many comedians exported. But um, it's this idea that really you're not supposed to show off. So yes, they, they, they wouldn't like, just like you're not supposed to have the number plate on your car that's saying, oh, look at me, I've got a new car. Um, you're not supposed to sh- show off your wealth. That is, you don't see lots of blingy Rolexes on arms in Denmark. Uh, but they, do, they don't sort of call it taking the piss, but I did get reviewed once when I did a talk for a big corporation and um, the, the, the CEO said, well, that was great, Helen, that was great. Um, you were um, piss scarp. And I was like, I'm sorry, what was I? And, it, and they mean piss sharp, scarp is sharp. So piss scarp is a great compliment. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they like here. <laughs> Well, you regularly give uh, talks and lectures internationally on happiness, change, work, workplace culture and that kind of thing. Uh, and what you go into what we can learn from other cultures about how to handle our emotions. Have you found that humour helps people better handle their emotions? I think so. I think it, it helps, you know, as you, we were talking about it, how it's contagious, how it can be infectious. I think it helps with collaboration. I see when I work more closely with teams, I think um, there's the statistic from, I think, Warwick University that said happier, happier workers are 12 percent more productive. And I think ha- being being funny in the workplace and humor definitely helps with being happier and productivity. I think I'm sure if you looked at maybe um, the number of days taken off sick or um, just how teams work together, I'm sure you'd see that it's a very good thing to invest in in the workplace. So if you were to write a business case uh, for humour in the workplace, what would you include in it? Obviously, all of our books. Um, I think, <laughs> you know, you could do trips to comedy clubs. I think, I think that you could definitely see whether all of the health benefits, for example, for humour, I think, short term it's reducing your stress it's soothing tension long term it can even boost your immune system um it's been proven to relieve relieve pain hasn't it so i think there's definitely something in improving your mood improving your relationships with the people around you it attracts others to us doesn't it i mean if you somebody is funny you want to be around them and they want to be around you so i think for that kind of that bonding and that bringing the people together and even diffusing conflict it's really important so, I mean, it sounds like that there is a real return on investment there, that if if you encourage humour in the workplace, I, I was just thinking when you said that, you know, in sales, how humour can immediately bond people. And so therefore, I, I have a theory that everybody's in sales on some level. So any company that encourages humour or lets humour thrive will... Uh, presumably have more sales as well. I think it, it's almost like a crossroads as well. When If you are at a conflict or a potential conflict situation, and especially if you're doing something over email where it's hard to read somebody and read the tone, it can very easily go one of two ways. It can very easily go into um, all out conflict and or misunderstanding and, and things go steadily downhill. Or you can either kill it with kindness or just turn on the funny and and things will go better and you will bring people together so i think it's hugely important for that i like i like turn on the funny but you're a creative you know you you've you've been an editor of uh, marieclaire.co.uk you've written all the books you do all the thing do you think 
creativity generally is enhanced by laughter. I suppose if you need a sort of levity to create, then you have to be playful. So in that respect, that would make sense. Um, do I think the, I'm sure there's some sort of formula we could work out there. Yes, I'm sure it, it plays into it in, in some way. But then you do get amazing TV drama writers, for example, who don't do the funny and they are still creative in their way. So I, I don't think it's it's exclusive, but I think for me, it's very helpful to have to have a levity and have a playfulness. I love the the, the term playfulness because I, I think that is what enhances it. Because, uh, you know, I think as we get older, maybe playfulness is knocked out of people because they go, you have to be serious. It's a serious job and we need to get on with it. Whereas children, you have three young children, are incredibly playful in order to get to the creative state. And and I think, I always encourage companies that I work with to to find playfulness and, and, and levity can actually lead to that creative space, which you wouldn't normally do. If you force people into going, okay, now come up with 10 good ideas about how we can increase the uh, turnover of the company. You look really scary there, listeners. Who anyone who's not watching, I, I'm absolutely terrified. I don't think I would be very creative at all after being told off like that. <laughs> but you see what I mean. It, 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 there is a, a I, I would call it state management, where you manage your state and you allow that to happen. I just wondered, with all your experience in, with you know the Atlas of Happiness, which is a brilliant book, by the way, you need to have at that in order to to get the best out of people don't you yeah i agree i think pets are very good as well if you haven't got any children nearby to wrangle get a dog or cats cat people always say that cats are good at playing as well but i think i am currently looking at a dog who looks very cheesed off he's not on a walk but there's something <laughs> about the daftness of of you know they say never work with children or animals always work with children or animals there's something about the daftness that that is a really good shortcut to to playfulness i think yeah oh daftness yeah well we're, we're putting that right up there um before we get to quick fire questions can you be a great communicator i mean a truly great communicator without understanding humor a oh, great communicator i was I thought you were going to say great leader and i think you can be a great leader without understanding humor and maybe that's okay i mean i feel as though we have had a lot of kind of showbiz and polish on leaders that hasn't been hugely helpful, let me say diplomatically. And <laughs> for all of the criticism that was levelled at someone like Gordon Brown, he was smart and he knew his stuff. And just because he wasn't slick and because he perhaps didn't um, communicate in that sort of shiny, shiny suit uh, showbiz way, meant that he was perhaps underestimated. And so I don't know... I don't know that that has to be the case. I'd be a bit suspicious of saying that. I don't mind the people who are the big thinkers in charge of the country being um, a li having a little more gravitas than me. So do you, do you think we've reached a stage whereby uh, having to have charisma or perceived um, humour has overtaken the need for, for competence? I think there's something very British about that, actually. Thinking about uh, the UK, for example, compared to Scandinavia or the rest of Europe, even when we were going through in the UK, the, the Boris times, the Liz Trust times, the rest of the world in a way that isn't reported in UK newspapers or certainly not enough. The rest of the world is sort of thinking, well, this is outrageous. Why are you putting up with this? This is madness. Whereas in the UK, we just laugh about it on Have I Got News For You? There is a sense that we will satirise it. And we do satire like no one else. We do satire brilliantly. But sometimes you have to get your placards and get out there and, and protest and fight. And I don't think we're very good at that. I think for all I love the British fear of earnestness, sometimes you have to be earnest and you have to stand up and, and be an ally or, or be an activist. And I think perhaps sometimes we, um, we avoid that and, and lean on satire a little too much. Well, that's really interesting because uh, we had John O'Farrell on the show. Do you know the writer John O'Farrell, uh, who originally was head writer at Spitting Image? And then have I got news for you? And he said his worry was that in Britain, uh, 
it is now we feel like we've done the job by poking fun at it rather than getting out with a placard and marching on the streets we we've gone look we've we've taken the mickey out of it therefore our job is done tick it's that and it's it's kind of blunted the uh, the actual steel of changing things you know just by you know having a laugh about it or sending a meme about it how fascinating yeah and you think about Alistair Campbell always says we should never call Boris Johnson just Boris. And yeah. the whole idea of laughing at Trump's hair or laughing at Boris Johnson's hair, just it's not the point. And, it, and it's sort of we shouldn't allow ourselves to be treated in this way. And so I think, yes, there's we have to be aware of that, don't we? So that's great that people like John O'Farrell are speaking out about it. How do we how do we get more people talking about that? I'm going to put well, it with you. You've got to do it, Paul. <laughs> well, we've had Alistair Campbell on the show. You know, we, we, we've had William Hague on the show. And and they're all sure that humour is needed to prick the bubble of pomposity. But have do we need more? Do we need to get back on the streets and, and start, uh, you know, fight the power, as they said in the Bronx? You've had Justin Trudeau on as well, haven't you? Uh, no, he's just a fan. Oh, he's a fan. How lovely. Well, I'm just, I'm curious. Well, now he'll hear this and then he'll come on your show. But that's an interesting one because obviously political family, but also that he has got the full package, so to speak. And <laughs> he's a very handsome man and he's very showbiz easy, but he can also do the job. So that's an interesting, maybe we shouldn't be all aiming for that. Maybe we should just be happy with someone who can just do yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. Helen, we've reached a point in the show which we like to call quick fire questions. Quick fire questions. Who's the funniest business person that you've met? I think I tend to come into organisations and be met by the events team or the or I meet the CEO just to shake their hand. And so I don't have the biggest breadth of experience here, but I would say that someone who I have uh, had more dealings with and more encounters with is the uh, the former CEO of Lego, now the chairman of the board, is Jorn V. And he was excellent at something that we talked about of having a kind of levity and he was business focused when it was demanded but he was also really fun and had a twinkle in his eye and I just think that's really special a really special quality to be able to um, have that gravitas when it was needed but also to be a very friendly personable interesting and interested human being. Do you know what sometimes just having that twinkle in your eye makes all the difference doesn't it? All about a twinkle yep. Yeah. What book makes you laugh? Do you know what? James Acaster's Guide to Quitting Social Media and Being the Best You That You Can Be, I believe, it's a very long title, which <laughs> I think many people have misunderstood and thought, well, this is terrible, this is long, this is strange. But actually, I think it's a work of genius. And if he hadn't, if he hadn't been a comedian to start with, I think it would be on the Booker, Booker Prize list. It's profound and exquisite and funny and really makes you think and it's everybody should read it immediately. Oh, James A. Custer, we'll, we'll have a look at that one. Now, you talked about oh, one of the films that make you laugh. Any other films that make you laugh? In the loop, I just think room meat is just a phrase that will now go down in history as being utterly brilliant. So I think we do do films like that really well in the UK. I'm always very proud of our comedy. We're going to take a shift to the other side, Helen, um, to, to look at things from a different angle. What's not funny? Punching down, we know now, is not funny. And really, really basic stuff. I think the blindingly obvious is not funny. And I feel like we can all do better and we should try. And that's not to be ungenerous to people who don't perhaps feel that they are naturally um, covered with mirth the whole time. But I think we should all be striving to be um, at the at the highest level of our intelligence or our, our capabilities. And so we should be just trying to to make things better. And um, and yeah, just not going for the most basic, the most obvious, the lowest common denominator. Punching down. I agree. Um, what word makes you laugh, Helen? Trombone. 
trombone, brilliant word. And then you and then you imagine it and then that makes you laugh as well. Then you imagine the sound and that makes you laugh as well. So it's just the gift that keeps on giving. I love, there was uh, somebody followed a dictator and I can't remember which country down the street and just played the trombone behind him as, as kind of the underscore of what it, and it just made this dictator look ridiculous. And I just thought, that's genius. That's right. That's like a sort of Dario Fo performance thing going on. I love it. You went to Exeter City University. You uh, then went on to study uh, journalism. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? Funny. I feel like you can always work on clever. You can always work on funny too, but you can always work on clever. So um, I feel like life would be a bit dull without funny. Um, and then if you didn't feel so clever, you could just study a bit more, maybe. I don't know. I think you've chosen the right one, to be honest, especially on the Humorology podcast. <laughs> Big tick for that one. Uh, and finally, Helen, Desert Island Gags. You can only take one joke with you to a desert island. What is it? What did the zero say to the eight? I don't know. What did the zero say to the eight? Nice belt. <laughs> only one I remember. And also from my kind of fashion days, it felt, it felt sort of strangely apt. And when you would be on the front row of a, a, you know, a catwalk show, it would kind of translate. It doesn't matter what language you're, you know, where someone's from. We all understand that one. Perfect. Lovely. <laughs> it was brilliant. It was perfect. You've been lovely. And I thank you so much for being a wonderful guest on the Humorology podcast. Lovely to be here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Helen. The Humorology podcast was hosted by Paul Barros, produced by David Rose, music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.